Okay, gang, uh, stat 1150, uh, we, we're starting confidence intervals um, just after finishing up uh, the central limit theorem. <clears throat> Got kind of a scratchy voice today. I think my allergies are, are doing a number on me. But uh, Confidence intervals are actually kind of my favorite thing to teach in this class. Um, I know that makes me sound like a, gi a gigantic geek, but uh, I guess I am. Uh, the, the tough part about confidence intervals is making the transition from central limit theorem, which deals with probability, uh, to confidence intervals, which deals with inference. So I'm going to go back to the same uh, kind of goofy picture that uh, I've shown you ad nauseum. You're probably sick of looking at it by now, right? But uh, w w again, w once we finished up... Uh, normal distributions, where we focused on a specific type of distribution that comes from a population that's perfectly bell-shaped and symmetric. So then we moved into looking and examining the relationship between samples and populations. Well, I told you this direction here where our population value parameters were known we could determine the likelihood of getting a sample, which would be unknown because we wouldn't know what we're going to get because we're drawing this sample at random. We can determine the likelihood of getting a particular sample from this population using probability. I've also told you ad nauseum that the reverse is called inference. Uh, it's called inferential statistics. By far, I think the most uh, important uh, branch of statistics uh, that, that we could, well, I know it is. There's no question about it. Well, what's known and unknown uh, reverses. In inference, we know our sample because we go out and we take one, and we use it to make an inference about an unknown value in a population. So, um, I think you may know by now that, that uh, I scuba dive. Uh, uh, my, it just wears my mom out. She hates the fact that her son, even though I'm no longer her, uh, a, a child, she hates the fact that her son is, uh, you know, playing around t t 100 feet down in the ocean. So, um, But anyway, there's, there's these things called sea fans. And I see them all the time when I'm when I'm diving in the Caribbean, um, and they're 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 not very pretty really. But uh, anyway, uh, studies show that uh, sea fans uh, have been infected and have come up with a disease, and because of it, a lot of them are dying. So if you were interested in sea fans and you would like to know what percentage of sea sea fans, so let's put it down here, the goal to find the percentage of sea fans that are infected. Let's say that's your goal, okay? So your population would be the percentage of all sea fans that are infected. Well, common sense should kick in and tell you that you can't go out and dig up all the sea fans in the world, take them back to a lab, and see how many are infected because then you would destroy um, the, uh, the plant. Um, I think it's a plant. Actually, no, I don't know. Uh, you would think I would know this because I've uh, come face to face with them. Um, I, said, I know it's a type of coral. Um, okay, anyway, um, I'm not sure. So let's just say it's a coral, this coral sea fan that are infected. Um, it would be kind of goofy to take them to, to dig them all up worldwide, take them back to the to, to the uh, uh, to the lab and find out what percentage are infected. So what percentage of sea fans are infected? I don't know. And neither does anyone else because, again, you'd have to uh, dig them all up and so on. But so what we could do is we could go out and take a sample. And let's say we did that. So let's say we dig up uh, 100 sea fans and find that... Uh, I got two that's there. 28 are infected. 
Now, so this tells us that 28 out of 100 of our sample are infected. So that tells us that 28% of the C fans are infected. Now, does that mean that it's 28% of the population? Absolutely not. This is a sample. This is 100 out of who knows how many millions of C fans there are worldwide. In fact, if we call this sample number one, we could go out and take sample number two, maybe 100 yards from our dive site, and we might come out with 32 out of 100. So 32% of the uh, second sample might be infected. And if we went down and got another sample, well, we might find that only 17 out of 100. You know, I don't know what we're going to find, but what I do know is I do know from the central limit theorem that samples vary. And, the, I mean, they're, they're bound to vary from, from, from sample to sample. So just because we go out and find one sample that yields a result of 28%, as I've uh, kind of just made up and demonstrated here, it doesn't mean that we're going to be so lucky that that matches exactly what we're looking for. It, it has no more likelihood of, of matching what we're looking for than this one or this one or all the many hundreds of thousands of samples that we could take. What's good about it? What's the one we got? What's good about it? It's the one we're going to use. This one means a lot to us because it's a sample we've got, but it's nothing holy about it. There are other samples, but we're using this one because it's the one we've got. So up here, we've got a sample. We know it. In this illustration here, it's 28 out of 100. We're going to use that to make an inference about an unknown. So guys, what we end up doing is we end up taking this 28% and because we know some samples will be higher and some samples will be lower, we build an interval around the sample. And what do we call this interval that's built around the sample with things called margin of error and stuff? Uh, we call this a confidence interval. Now, for the sake of this class, you guys are going to learn two types of confidence intervals. The first kind of confidence interval that you're going to learn is called a mean confidence interval. And the other type that you're going to learn is called a proportion. Means deal with averages. Proportions deal with percentages. Sometimes these problems can be... Uh, uh, posed uh, a very, very um, uh, to, to look a lot alike. For example, what if I wanted to find the average student loan debt for students who just graduated from Shawnee State University? The average student loan debt. Well, that would be a mean problem because I want to examine the average. But what if I wanted to look at the percentage of students who have an average uh, student loan debt of 20000 or more. I want to look at the percentage of Shawnee State University students have an average of 20000 or more. That would be a proportion because the focus isn't on the 20000 That doesn't vary. We're setting that kind of as the benchmark. We're looking at the percentage. So guys, proportions deal with percentage. If the unknown we're looking for is a percentage, we're going to do a proportion problem. If it's examining an unknown average, we're going to do a mean problem. Now, the next thing we get into is what type of distribution do we use to model these problems? Well, it turns out for the proportion problem, we use what's called a z-distribution. And guys, we should know by now that these are normal with a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. This distribution is what we studied back in Central Limit Theorem. The mean problem uses a new distribution called a t-distribution. Now, let me tell you a little bit about a t-distribution. The reason we have to vary or deviate from the z-distribution is, guys, if you remember back to the central limit theorem, go back to those handouts. I told you 
we begin with a population where the mean and the standard deviation are known. That's the way I started every single um, um, uh, demonstration and lecture on the central limit theorem. I, and go back and look at them. I, I would write a big circle here and I would say begin with a population where the mu and sigma are known. Well, the problem is when we start estimating means, we use a sample and the population standard deviation isn't known. So we have to make a modification and use a different distribution than the one we learned back in the central limit theorem. Now, a few things about the uh, t distribution. First of all, it depends on the degrees of freedom. Guys, the degrees of freedom is one of the easiest things I will ever ask you to calculate. The degrees of freedom is just a sample size minus one. So if you're trying to estimate the uh, average student loan debt for students at Shawnee State University who just graduated, and you go out and take a sample of 15 students, then your degrees of freedom is what? 15 minus 1, it would be 14. The T distribution is awfully close to the Z distribution that we talk about up here, especially as our degrees of freedom get larger. Now, guys, once you get out to a degrees of freedom of about 100, then your T distribution and Z distribution take on a very, very similar look. But, uh, uh, but, but again, you got to have a larger sample size. So, guys, there's one of these. There's infinitely many of these. Each T distribution depends on the degrees of freedom. Each Z distribution relies on the Z distribution. There's only one of them. This thing doesn't vary. The T distribution does. Uh, one more thing about the t distribution, the mean will always be equal to zero, just like it is in the normal distribution, but uh, standard deviation uh, will vary. And we never even worry about the standard deviation because the degrees of freedom take care uh, of the variation for us. So, uh, a little bit more about a t distribution. Uh, if we were looking at a degrees of freedom, say, equal to five, then we're going to have a distribution that looks like a normal distribution, but it's going to be just a little bit wider than a normal distribution. As the degrees of freedom increases, say it jumps up to 10, it's still going to be centered at zero, but it's going to have a little taller and a little narrower, and then that's absolutely horrible. Uh, pr pretend that looks good, okay? Uh, that, that's going to drive me crazy. Uh, it's going to be a little taller. Uh, there you go, much better. Uh, and a little narrower. Still going to be centered at zero. Now, guys, finally, what are the formulas? Now, again, the confidence intervals that we're going to examine are for a mean where we use x bar to make a estimate of mu and the other is the proportion or percentage where we use a sample proportion to make an estimate of p. So in each situation what happens is we take our sample which we call a point estimate. Build error around this thing and create our confidence interval. Our focus is usually, it's the industry standard, on a 95% confidence interval. So if you're looking at a problem uh, and it doesn't tell you a confidence interval, assume it's 95%. Others we will use in research. You sometimes see 90% confidence intervals. Again, 95% is the industry standard, and 99% is another confidence interval that is often reported. We will focus 
on the 95% as we build through these lectures. Now the fun part. What's the formulas look like? Well, if we're dealing with a mean, the formula is to take the center. Again, the sample in this situation is X bar. So we go out and we take a sample mean and we use it to estimate an unknown population mean. So that's in the center and then we build error above it by adding stuff. We build error below it by subtracting stuff because we know there's nothing holy about this sample mean that we get. We know they're going to fluctuate. So we build error to allow for that fluctuation. So we're going to add some stuff and we're going to subtract some stuff. What we add here is called a T star, which is the T critical value, times the standard deviation over the square root of n. On the left hand side, we start with the sample, which in this case is p hat. We take the critical value, which is z star, but this time we take the standard error, which is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat all over n. Now guys, that should look familiar. Except for the fact that we're using, back in central limit theorem, we used p here, but we can't use p now because it's unknown. So we use the closest thing to it, uh, and, uh, well, <laughs> we hope it's close to it, uh, p hat. Now, what's this thing called right here? This is called our point estimate. What's this thing called? This is called our critical value. What's this thing called? It's the standard error of our estimate. All of this over here is called the margin of error. Guys, let me see if we can get this a little bit clearer. Okay. Same thing over here. What's this one called? Well, it's called your point estimate. What's this called? It's called your critical value. Now, it's important to say that this is called your t-critical. This is called your z-critical. This right here is called the standard error of your estimate. And everything over here is called your margin of error. All right, now, just for the heck of it, I told you that the confidence intervals that we typically use are either a 90%, a 95%, or a 99%. Let's just go ahead and calculate some of these Z-criticals that we're going to use right here. Now, guys, we can go to stack crunch and do that. So ultimately, what we're looking for, and let's just start with the 95%. What we are looking for is we're looking for, in z-scores, again, they have a mean of 0, standard deviation equal to 1. We're looking for the two z-scores that encompass the middle 95%. of our data. Now guys, because the mean is zero, anything to the left is negative, so we know this is going to be a negative value. Anything to the right is positive, so we know this is going to be a positive value. So how can we find the values that go there? And I'll go ahead and tell you, it's going to be plus or minus 1.96. The negative 1.96, the positive 1.96. Because of symmetry, we know these numbers have to be the same, except one's negative, one's positive. Now, how do I get that? Well, I know it, but let's um, let's go get. Um, I should have already been logged in, and uh, guys, I forgot. So let's go ahead and get into my math lab. Hopefully, it'll work quickly. 
That girl cracks me up there. She looks like she's having way too much fun to be in a math class. By the way, professors love students like that. Usually. I not say always, but... All right, let's go to stat. Uh, guys, if you're taking this in a different term other than summer 2017, yeah, just, just generalize. Stat crunch. Go to the website. All right, so what we want to do is we want to go to stat, and we want to go to calculator, and I want to go to normal. Just, just for the heck of it, look down here. We haven't talked about this distribution here, the T distribution. Well, guys, that, do you think it has anything to do with that T critical? Absolutely. Now, I want between here. So I want to know with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one between what two values does 95% of my distribution fall? Well, guys, there's your negative 1.96 and your positive 1.96. So that's the reason in that table back here that I wrote the negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. What about the 90%? What would it look like? Well, that's pretty easy, isn't it? <laughs> so negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. So we have the plus and the minus. Now what about the 99%? 2.576 negative. So plus and minus 2.576. Now I'm going out to three places there because it's customary to do so. But, uh, you know, this, this uh, 8 pushes that number up to uh, to 6, to, so 2.576 is what uh, I'm actually reporting. Alright gang, let's go back to combine all this stuff. Now let's just work a problem. Let's go back to the C fans. So again, the goal... What percentage of C fans are infected. What's the answer to that? Don't know. Have no idea. Step one. Collect a sample. Let's say we go down and for some reason we decide we're going to bring, up, bring back 120 C fans. So we randomly select 120 C fans. How many have the disease? I don't know. We'll call that X because it's standard notation to do that. Let's say that we find that 13 have the disease. Calculate p hat. Well, guys, p hat is x over n. It's the number out of the hole that has what we're measuring. In this case, it's 13 C fans. n is 120. Now, I can if I want. Let me grab my calculator. Uh, I can if I want. Um, so I have, what, 13 divided by 120. So I have 0.108, so that's approximately 10.8%. Now, if you want to do stupid statistics, run around here and say, well, about 11% of all C fans are infected. No, that's not what we're saying. About 11% of these 120 are infected. To generalize this to all C fans,
this video is really making me want to go diving. I'll just tell you. I know you don't care, but uh, it really is. In fact, I got some uh, got some big dives scheduled here in about two weeks. So, uh, to generalize to all sea fans, we calculate a confidence interval. And the confidence interval for this type of problem is p hat plus or minus z star square root of p hat 1 minus p hat over n. My p hat is 0 0.108. Plus or minus my Z star, so we're going to do a 95% confidence interval. Z star is 1.96 times the square root P hat times 1 minus P hat. over in which was 120 C fans. I'm going to do two problems here. We're going to do the minus first. We're going to do the plus second. And we're going to put it in interval form. So, guys, I'm going to use my calculator here. Now, I'm going to show you how to do these on Stack Crunch. It's a lot easier. So, I have 0.108 plus 1.96 times the square root. 0.108 times 0.892 divided by 120. So my left is 0.164. The right one, all I have to do is do this. All I need to do is change the plus or the negative to a plus. No, wait a minute, I did a negative. That's not cool. Uh, I want to do a negative first. Hmm, guys, I messed up. I want to do the negative first. I don't know why I did the positive. So 0 0.052 times 0 0.052. And the positive is a 0 0.164. So guys putting this in percentages. Again, our answer. was that. Now typically we don't speak in proportions. You know, if we talk about you know, what proportion of your house is carpeted, you don't say, well, 0.73. That's kind of goofy. You say, well, about three-fourths or 75 percent. So what I would want to do, because we want to know the percentage of C fans that are infected, I would report this as 5.2 percent. to 16.4 percent. Interpretation there is a 0.95 because we did a 95 percent confidence interval probability that this interval contains the percentage 
of all C fans that are infected. Now, notice I didn't say there's a 0.95 probability that the percentage of all C fans that are infected is in this interval. That's technically not correct. You got to make the the probability statement about something you know. We got this interval here. And, th and think about it. If there's another diver went down, got 120. He or she may would get something different in 13 more than likely because samples vary. So we'd have a different confidence interval. So this is a confidence interval, not the confidence interval. Okay. Now something else that we report a lot is margin of error. And margin of error is something you report especially when you deal with uh, confidence intervals with percentages. Margin of error just gives you a, 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 a kind of a statement about the width of the interval, but it's not the width. The margin of error is from the center out to each one of these values. Now the easiest way to calculate the margin of error is to take the high value minus the low value divided by 2. So for our problem I take the high value minus the low value divided by 2 I get 11.2 divided by 2 so I get a margin of error of 5.6 percent or depending on the way you're asked to and uh, to, to report that 0 0.056. Now uh, I'm going to end this video here and uh, the next video I'm going to put up I'm going to run through a uh, uh, an example dealing with a mean problem. This this was uh, I, I kind of got on a tangent here. I, I really had no uh, 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 plans of actually doing this but uh, maybe I'm just thinking about diving too much. I'll tell you what let's have some fun. Um, quiz. Aren't you glad you stuck around? Okay. Uh, send an email to me. Uh, by the time this assignment is due on my math lab. Now it's, that's going to depend on the semester you're taking it. So the video that you're currently watching will ultimately have an assignment on my math lab. When it is due, the last second that you can turn that in, this has to be sent to me. And all you have to do in the subject line C fan quiz. In the body Dr. Darbro's favorite hobby is scuba diving. Guys, you do that, you get 25 out of 25 for a quiz score. If you don't do that, you get 0 out of 25. So, uh, guys, have a great day. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, the next uh, video I'll put up an example. Um, and again, let, let me let me go back up. I want to be very thorough here. Let's go back to again to the two types of problems. What we just did here is we looked at a percentage because we want to know the percentage of all C fans. I'm going to give you an example uh, for the average where we get into this T distribution and explore it and um, and work a problem just like what we did there. So with the C fans. Guys, take care.